here I have listed my email um, address is also over Canvas. So today we are going to talk about why do we really care about what we're going to learn throughout the semester. Um, we just went through uh, the syllabus, the schedule, um, um, and I would like to jump into some introductory material. Okay, so let me start with a brief history of topological data analysis uh, or computational topology. So the whole field is, in my opinion, a really wonderful marriage between math and computer science. But of course, there's other players right now. Um, but it's very much depends on who you're asking. It's a field which roughly is 20 years old. Um, it's kind of started at the late 1999 or early 2000. Uh, where uh, a bunch of researchers who are traditionally in the research area of, of computational geometry start thinking about uh, what's called computational topology, which is essentially a combination of algebraic topology and computer science. So that's where uh, the field is born. But of course, uh, you know, <laughs> depends on who you ask. Um, some some folks in the field is also arguing that you know this field really started uh, by thinking about uh, folks who working applied uh, topology. And applied topology is more than much more than twenty years old. But you know, in here, I'm going to use the sort of argument that this is roughly started in early two thousand uh, from sort of the techniques that's known as persistent homology and barcode. And we're going to go over that later in the semester. Okay, so the reason why I'm saying this is a young field, it's only 20 years old, it's a very exciting area, because if you go back to the history of computational geometry, when computational geometry is at the early years, you know, there's a lot of open questions which are in some sense low hanging fruits and then there's a lot of research papers written uh you know for things like how do you com com uh, compute convex hole in two dimension you know how do you uh do like point location problems and so on and so forth i would say computational topology is roughly in this sort of same kind of period where there's still a lot of low hanging fruit a lot of open research questions so it's very exciting um the other thing I want to mention is that, well, I think it's very cool because it's, you know, topology data analysis isn't just one tool, right? It's, it's the entire area that has a collection of new data analysis tools. So therefore, there's a lot of data applications in the domain that people are still kind of exploring, right? Um, another thing is that there's a lot of uh, great and fun people who work in these areas. Um, they are mathematicians, they are computer scientists, they are statisticians, and they're also in general data scientists who are looking into using topology based techniques for data analysis. Um, and then, you know, because of this hybrid between different fields, um, that's also why it's so exciting is because you can think about how do you combine statistics with topology data analysis, how do you combine machine learning with, you know, topology data analysis, how do you use topology and visualization and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's also very interdisciplinary, as I mentioned, from, for, from the math side, it's coming from things like algebraic topology primarily, but there's also elements coming from differential topology, there's also more theory, um, so on, coming from stats, statistics, there's machine learning, there's manifold learning, if you, you know, for example, PCA, which is dimensionality reduction techniques, is one of those classic manifold learning techniques. Uh, there's also coming from other sort of engineering disciplines, uh, such as sort of electronic engineering, where you can study sensor networks. There's also coming from physics, uh, astronomy, where you can use topology techniques to model the universe. Of course, you know, it's also uh, fundamentally is also a computational thing so that there's a lot of data analysis techniques that developed. Um, the other thing that I'm very excited, you know, also partially because this field is only 20 years old, is that all the researchers, in some sense, arguably, is on their third, second or the third generation of researchers, right? There's the first generation of folks, uh, you know, who are much more, uh, you know, slightly more senior who started this field, and then there's this next generation. And largely, I would say that the folks who are in this area, are, you know, on average, you know, are, are fairly young, right? There's very, there's a lot of energy in this field, and then there's a lot of open questions. 
Okay, so like I said, there's three components throughout the material in this class that's really related to how it's interact with you sort of foundational methods, theory, algorithms, and machine learning statistics, and how it's applied in data science. So let's start with the data science. Okay, so let me just talk about a few examples how topology techniques classically have been used um, um, in sort of various applications. Um, one of those ones is, you know, in 2013, where uh, folks are using topological techniques in this particular case is a mapper techniques and it's a particular set of algorithms that we're going to describe. But the idea is we're looking at high dimensional data set that is coming from uh, patient data. So in this particular case, I believe this is sort of breast cancer patient data. So there's a genetic information for each patient. And then the idea is to use topological techniques to study the bifurcation of the patient population. So they were looking at what are the genes that is most dominant, that is important with respect to sort of survival of the breast cancer patient, okay? So at the end of the slides, you will see the actual references. And if you are interested, you can dive into this particular application uh, story. Um, so the idea is, you know, th this picture here is a graph based summary of this high dimensional point cloud and each of the you know at the end of this branching part is where they're interested in looking at how does certain um, certain effect which is in this case ESR1 which is a particular gene and the behavior of that gene seems to be very important with respect to the survival of the patient itself. Okay, so this is one example, and then the techniques behind it is called the mapper uh, graph, which we're going to study in this class. The second example, of course, is you can use topological techniques to study networks, in this specific case, brain networks. Okay, so what is a brain network? A brain network is that um, there's functional brain network and a structural brain network. Structural brain network is related to how fibers of the brain, um, you know, kind of, you know, connect physically from one area of the brain to the another. The other uh, functional brain network is study how different parts of the brain are correlated when performing a particular task. Um, and then what uh, you obtain a, a functional brain network is through brain imaging, like functional uh, MRI, MRI. So the idea of you know, uh, using topological tools to study brain network, uh, it seems to be natural because the network itself is talking about connectivity between different entities and so on and so forth. So this particular example I'm giving here is try to use topological, uh, topological techniques to do regression, meaning that we're going to extract uh, topological features from brain network and especially brain network coming from autism. So we're looking at, you know, if I take the functional brain network from an autistic patient versus a functional brain network um, of, of a control and how different their topological signatures are and how those topological signatures are correlated with behavior metric um, in autism, okay? So that's another interesting application of topology in data science. Okay, so here's another example where in um, so topological techniques is actually used a lot um, in scientific simulation and visualization. Um, in this particular case, you are doing a simulation of combustion. So what is a combustion simulation? You throw multiple, ke multiple chemicals uh, into the chamber and you kind of simulate, uh, you know, when it's combust and uh, what is the temperature, what is the pressure um, and all this. And then of course, one of the questions is to study the time evolution of the features that is related to the combustion simulation. Okay. For example, here, you know, you can track, you know, over time axis, how does different part of, you know, uh, the front part, you know, if you think about things combust, right, there's going to be a front part and how it's involved over time. And then um, in here, in term of, in general, in scientific visualization, in sort of feature tracking, uh, there's a lot of topological techniques that is in that space. The other one is actually the use of topological techniques in material science. Um, this work is quite old. It has been more than, you know, more than 13 years old, but it's really a good example of how topological techniques can be used in this particular case. Um, it's, it's sort of um, a study the impact of a micro meteoroid in the porous material, right? So you have a um, porous medium and you have sort of something that is shoot towards it. And then you want to look at the change of the structure as it's suffered from certain impact uh, from a meteoroid. 
right? So that's one example. But one interesting application of tabulatio techniques, and if you see the uh, sort of literature right now, there's a lot more applications of how tabulatio techniques can be used in material science. Um, but in this particular example, for example, in the button here, is that we are using topology to try to extract sort of the skeleton of the materia and then try to study how that skeleton changes when you have a particular um, sort of impact, how it's deformed. So you can describe the change of the structure using topology. Okay. Well, the other really interesting aspect of topology techniques is how it can be used um, in study data from astronomy, right? So here I give an example of Disperse, which is a tool that is built to try to extract the skeleton of, uh, uh, of a filament in the universe. So in the picture on the left, what you see is actually what they call the filament, uh, which is really high density area where there's uh, galaxies and, um, and the planets and things like that. So those are usually coming from simulation data in astronomy. Astronomy, and then in here, uh, topological techniques can be used to again describe the structural skeleton of those filament. And then particular technique they use are called Morse and Morse male complexes. Um, again, that is another topic uh, in this class. Okay, so. All right, so here are some just examples of applications. Let's talk about what are those fundament, uh, foundation concepts for this class. Specifically, um, you know, again, we're going to use a data example, but it will help you understand uh, example of type of topological concept we're going to learn throughout this class. First of all, is that, you know, this is just, a, again, a scientific simulation. You have what's it called a Radley Taylor instability simulation. So basically, you have two types of material and then they interact with one another. What I'm showing here is sort of the interface of those two different materials. And one of the interesting question is, you know, let's call them those sort of surfaces, let's call them bubbles, okay? And what's interesting about those bubbles is that there's a tip of the bubble, which we call the local maximum. Um, and the idea is as the simulation goes on, those bubbles is going to change their shape over time. And then the idea is how do we quantify the change of shapes? Okay, and then specifically, one interesting statistics is I would like to know as my simulation goes on, how many of those bubbles do I get? Those, you know, each individual bump is considered a bubble and how many do I get as the simulation goes on? Okay, so then it's a question of how do I define what is a bubble, right? There's some intuitive definition of the interface, which is how the bubble looks like, but how do I define that mathematically? So the idea of this, for example, in the left-hand side is that one way I would like to define the bubble is that I would like to define, say, a single bubble to be all the points whose gradient, well, in this case, I'm talking about gradient, meaning ascending direction, right? Whose gradient is going to flow to the same local maxima. Okay, so for example, everything in this purple is, is a single bubble because every single point, as I'm you know, looking at the gradient direction, is going to flow to that local maxima right there. So this is one single bubble, and behind it, it's like sort of light purple. That's another bubble because, again, every point that is going to be flying, uh, flow towards the local maxima, okay? And of course, what happened to a point which is at the intersection, right? So you need to make a decision at the intersection. Well, you can make an arbitrary choice or later on, you know that there's a specific rule I can use to decide you know, which part that is going to belong to. But again, if I have a point that is uh, you know, in the direction uh, in the lower part, which is in the uh, green bubble, it's all the points whose gradient flow to that local minimum, maximum. Okay. So however, if you look at the right picture, something different is happening. The idea is, well, not all bubbles are created equal in the sense that not all of them are significant enough for me to count as a single bubble. So the idea is I would like to introduce techniques to sort of simplify my data so that certain bubbles that I initially decide are considered noise. For example, in this case, you know, I'm merging two nearby ones into the purple bubble is because I consider the nearby tiny bubble to be of not of that much of importance. Of course, then you need to ask, how do I quantify the importance 
And this is where topology techniques can come in. And then the tool we use is called persistence simplification. And again, we're going to go describing the theoretical foundation behind it. But the practical implication is now among all the bubbles initially I extracted, I can actually simplify them by merging the sort of noisy bubbles into bigger significant bubbles. And then my statistics now is based on those significant bubbles instead. And how is this used? Okay, so now you can actually use this kind of techniques by simplifying um, the bubble formations, I, or what I call topological features. I can now look at sort of how those bubbles change over time. For example, on the left corner is at 100 time steps of the simulation. Um, and then I move on to around 350 steps and how I move on around to 700 steps. As you can see, as sort of time goes on, small bubbles merge into bigger bubbles and into bigger bubbles. So essentially I'm using topology to kind of perform segmentation of my domain into important features. And now I can study the statistics associated with those features. And what that really leads to is you can look at this kind of graph that kind of describe this mixing process of two materials in the scientific simulation. And you know, going from left to right, you can talk about essentially if you look at the merge, it's how two bubbles can merge into one single bubble or how a given bubble was split into two bubbles and how some of the bubble will be born and some of the bubble will die, meaning that it will disappear in that process. So now this become a time a uh, varying simulation where you are using topology to cheat, uh, keep track of the evolution of features over time. Okay. All right. So this is the one applications. Um, and there is fundamentally what we call Morse and Morse smell complex. So let, let's get back to what are the foundational concepts you're going to see throughout the semester. So there's a really, really old joke uh, that describe a topologist, right? Um, topologists are the folks who think the coffee mug and then the donut is the same, right? This is a really old joke because what is the idea behind it? One of the main topological features people care about, topologists care about, is that there's a handle in the coffee mug. So there's a loop like here. Okay, actually here, this is a non-standard Here's a loop right here. And then if you have the standard donut, of course, um, you know, it has a donut hole in the middle. So there's another loop. And the main idea of sort of think about topology is that I'm allowing my sh this two shape to deform into one another. So I can deform my coffee mug into the donut without breaking or tearing. Okay. So there is a smooth transition between those two shapes because they both have, in this particular case, they have a very interesting topological feature, uh, which is a loop, okay? And if we study algebraic topology, the concept of this is called homology. Um, and it's specifically dimension one homology, uh, which is keeping track of loops or tunnels of your data. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I give an example of how we use Morse complex and Morse smell complexes to do the segmentation of the scientific simulation. So there are several key developments in topological data analysis. I'm giving uh, those two examples. The first one is we can use topological structures to uh, perform abstraction of the data. And here the picture I showed here is if I have a two-dimensional scalar field and uh, you know, in the gray picture on the left, it's sort of think about I'm picturing my uh, scalar field, which has a two dimensional domain and it's a height function going up and down, right? Think about it as a terrain. Then in order for me to up, um, obtain uh, abstraction of the scalar field, there's two ways I can do that. Uh, one is I'm going to partition the domain based on the gradient behavior, meaning that I'm going to, you know, as what I described in those bubble formation, I'm going to define a bubble as all the points whose gradient end up in the same local maxima, okay? But in this case, if I rely on the direction of the gradient over every single point in the domain, I can study what's called more smell complex, okay? I'm gonna go into that detail soon. 
The second type of topological uh, sort of uh, structures we can work with are very much like graph based or tree based things where we're relying on what's called the contour of the function. So what is the contour of the function? In this case, a contour of the function is all the points in the domain that has the same function value. So in this particular case, if I choose a particular uh, height value, a contour will be a ring in the domain. So this is very much like what you look at in a map, right? When you look at the elevation map, uh, those circles were basically contours. And then the contour tree is idea of, I kind of shrink each contour to a single point. And I'm looking at how contours at, at different height are related to each other. So again, we're going to go through animation very soon. So that is the first set of techniques, which I call abstraction. So you can use topological structures as abstraction of your data. They're either tree-based or they're uh, complex-based. Then the second very big development in the field is called persistent homology. And the idea is how do you separate signal from noise? Uh, when you have data set. And then persistent is a very, persistence is a really important notion to describe how important a particular data, uh, data feature is, okay? So let's look at contour tree first, okay? Again, imagine I have a two-dimensional scalar function that is defined on the domain. And in this particular case, all the dotted lines um, are considered um, sort of all the points of the same height value. And I'm going to start from top, meaning that I'm going to start with a mountain top. Okay. So in this particular case, I'm looking at you know all the contours uh, whose height function is above certain threshold. In this case, it start by having two local maxima. So those are the two mountain tops that you see on the left picture. Okay. Because there's two mountain tops at this height value, I'm having two components in the tree. And now I'm going to slowly decrease the height value and see how the contours kind of you know, grow as I'm decreasing the function value. So in the next level, right, um, I'm decreasing my height value. I'm going to go over another third mountaintop, which corresponding to this new point here. This is the third mountaintop, which is the local maxima of this function. So that gives birth to another component or another cluster, if you will. So in this case, now you see on the le left picture, there's really three components that is disconnected from one another. This corresponded to the three of the leaf node of this tree structure. As you can imagine, as I decrease further, I'm going to go over a saddle point. Okay, so here now you see a saddle point, which means that the both, uh, both of those critical points, sort of components grow, grow, grow until they merge at a saddle point. So what is a saddle point? If you ever go hiking, right? You're, you're sort of walking along the ridge and of the mountain. At some point when you say you're at the saddle, that means you have two directions where you can go up and then you can you have two directions where you can go down. So this particular case is that you are entering a saddle point where the two component merges into a single component. So again, in this particular case, we have four components, okay? And then you know coming from and, and then and then two of the components merge at the saddle point. And as I increase or decrease my function value, again more and more components will merge over the saddle point, and so on. And now what you get is a tree structure on the right hand side that talks about how the contours interact with each other as I'm decreasing my function value. Okay, so what's really interesting about this structure is that it's looking at the relations between different parts of the function, which is uh, critical points um, and, um, uh, and, and which are in this case local maxima and saddles and local minimum. Okay. You can do the same thing. In this particular case, my domain is no longer a subset of the plane. In this case, my domain is a triple torus, okay, the surface of a triple torus. So this is what's called a rib graph. So again, what you have is you have a torus with three holes, okay? Um, and then it's standing up, so you have a height function, so it's a color in rainbow color from the blue to red, and you have a height function defined on it. So what again, what you do is you look at the contour of this function at a fixed height value. 
For example, at any, for example, height value in between, you see that there is two loops at this height value and each of the loop you're going to shrink to a single point. And by doing that, at every single height value, you take the components and they shrink to a point and you connect those points together as you go from the highest function value to the lowest function value. Again, it's the same idea as the contour tree with exception that my domain is now a manifold, okay? But by doing this now, you still get abstraction. The abstraction on the right-hand side is no longer a tree structure, but specifically this is now a graph structure and it's called a rib graph. And what's interesting about rib graph, it captures precisely those three tunnels or three loops from my uh, triple donut, okay? So it's actually preserved in some sense, the shape of the underlying manifold. Another way to think about this is now the rib graph is a skeleton of my data, okay? While it, you know, it loses some information, for example, it loses information such as you know, curvature of the surface and so on and so forth, but it preserves those three tunnels of the shape. So you can imagine why this is interesting uh, in sort of machine learning tasks. For example, if I have a bunch of shapes, I can use rib graph as a skeleton of those shape, and I can then classify those shapes by classifying those skeletons. That has been done before in a research paper, okay? So what's the next thing? The next thing is Jacobi set. Um, Jacobi set is the idea that I have two functions defined on the same domain, and I'm looking at the part of my domain where the gradient of those two functions are either aligned or anti-aligned. So again, it's sort of a gradient-based topological descriptor and people also has been using it to study the relation between two functions. Okay. So now let's get back to um, the technique we use to study those bubble formations. And at the end of it, it's, it's related to what's called Morse complex and Morse smell complex, okay? So the idea of what's a Morse smell complex, it's sort of, again, based on the gradient behavior of, um, of the function. So again, I have a two-dimensional function in this example. And imagine a two-dimensional function, I have up and down, up and down, sort of it's like a terrain. So the first type is called a Cindy manifold. Um, which is also called the Morse complex of this function. The idea is the domain of the function is decomposed into clusters. In this case, each cluster corresponding to a, a different color. And each of the cluster are all the points in the domain. If you follow the gradient, it's going to end up at the same local maximum. In this case, the local maximum is the red point. And all the points that belongs to say, in this case, uh, the sort of the brown cluster is because if you follow the gradient, they all, all end up into that red point, which is the local maximum, okay? So this is called a, a sort of the Morse complex of F. Similarly, I can also do Morse complex of minus F. So what does that mean? That means I'm going to also do another partition of the point in the domain where the inverse of its gradient will end up to the same local minimum. In this picture, local minimum are blue points. So you are essentially thinking about there's this basin surrounding the local minimum and each basin became a cluster. So now what is more smell complex? More smell complex is taking sort of all the partition based on local maximum, so those bumps, and intersect with the partition that is surrounding the basin, which are those you know, you know, local minimums. And I take the intersection and that gives me the more smell complex. Okay, so the inter what does intersection do? Oh, I have a picture here. Now, if I look at this, every single partition, it's going to contain the points. If you follow the ascending gradient, it's going to end up at the same maximum. And if you have a descending gradient, it's going to end up in the same local minimum. Okay, so now more smell complex essentially partition my domain based on the gradient behavior where the gradient behavior of every single point is, um, is quantified by the destination and origin of the gradient, okay? So that is showing to be 
are important. Okay. Just a sec. So more small complex has seen a lot of applications in scientific visualization, especially for feature extraction and feature tracking. All right. And then there's also applications of sort of simplifying terrain. So as you can see on the top part, top left corner, is sort of the skeleton of the more small complex of a piece of, say, the piece of the terrain data. And then at the lower button on the right-hand side is actually the simplification of this terrain by, again, using the same kind of philosophy as I described before, when I consider bubble and bubble merging. In this case, I can consider some of those mountaintops to be noise. Uh, because a small perturbation will get rid of them. Um, and some of those big mountaintops to be signatures or features that I want to preserve. So by extracting the topological skeleton using uh, sort of, in this case, more small complexes, I can actually simplify the terrain and obtain a more compact representation. So like I said, the other tool that we are going to use is called persistence homology, right? So um, again, I'm not going to the mathematical foundations of it, but right now let's just look at, you know, from more philosophical perspective, right? This is a painting um, that, you know, uh, I think I don't no longer violate the copyright uh, thing for this painting since it's been done for a while. But the one's idea is that if you walk very close to this painting in the museum, right? Like it will make you look really weird, but you go like pretty much like this close to the painting, you will see a bunch of dots of it. But if you kind of step back, you know, like five, 10 meters, you all of a sudden you start making sense of this, um, right? So where your eye, your brain perform the task of taking the sea of data of individual points and assemble them into a coherent image, okay? so. What is the main idea when I'm looking at this picture is I can infer something continuous from something that is inherently discrete, okay? And that is really the philosophy from persistent homology. Another way to think about this is this painting, which inherently is a bunch of points, right? And persistent homology is, a, is sort of a tool that takes those data points and try to infer some features from those data points that is corrupted with noise. That is really uh, sort of the philosophical understanding of persistence is how do I deal with discrete point sets, possibly with noise? How do we infer features from it? And then the tool we use, how do we tell features from noise is persistent homology. And at the root of it, I'm not going to go into detail, but if you start with a point cloud, you're going to build a, what's called a filtration or essentially, uh, you know, I have a parameter as the parameter increases, I'm looking at the change of connectivity of the underlying point sets. And it's described by a filtration of simplicial complexes. And then we study that filtration to try to quantify the significance of the features that appear and disappear throughout this process. Okay, so we will have a few lectures which is specifically dedicated to uh, computation of persistent homology. Okay, so let me get into a little bit detail over, you know, again, when I talk about simplification of those bubbles and the root of it is what's called persistent simplification, which is simplification based on persistent homology. Okay, so again, what you see here, this is a skeleton of the more small complex we described before the sort of the gold lines are the one dimensional skeleton. So again, when you go hiking, those are some part of this is a ridge, you know, especially the connection between local maximum and saddle. Those are the rich lines that you go on when you actually go hiking. Okay. So once you have this, my idea is, well, now if you look at this, there's two mountain tops. There is two mountain top that is marked by red. Okay. So of course, if you are hiking, your idea is I want to get to the highest mountaintop, right? So the height or the elevation of those mountaintop is your sort of notion of significance. But there's a slightly different notion of significance, which still says that the right mountaintop is still more significant on the left mountaintop is because if I introduce a small perturbation of this, that the right mountaintop will remain, 
while the left mountaintop may not. Okay, so it's a question of how much perturbation do you introduce to get rid of a particular feature is sort of the idea of the persistence is that, you know, left point is going to have less of a persistence versus the right mountaintop is going to have more persistence. So what do I mean by that? You know, if I perturb the underlying function slightly, for example, in this case, the left mountaintop and the saddle point may kind of be both eliminated once imagine I push down the mountaintop on the left slowly and raise the saddle point gradually. Then what you see is a simplified terrain, okay? So now the amount of perturbation introduced is sort of related to the persistence of those, okay? So again, if you look at before and after persistent flication, is that in that area where those two mountaintops are, I kind of simplify my data, but outside of that domain, you know, in this particular example, uh, it's not changed, okay? So we are using this kind of simplification in our bubble formation example to try to merge two bubbles into one. Okay, so now let me describe some interaction between topology data analysis with machine learning and statistics. One thing that you just get a taste of is a more small complex where you know that the points in the domain are partitioned based on their gradient flow. So their gradient flows to the same local maximum and the inverse gradient goes to the same local minimum. So what's really interesting about it is that this introduced a partition of the points in the domain into regions where the region perform monotonically. So if you have a monotonic collection of points, what you can do using fit a linear model to those points. So for each of the domain partition, because it follow the gradient, it changes monotonically, you can fit a linear regression for each of the partition. So now you can actually apply a regression as a mixture model of a bunch of linear regressors. Okay, so that's one of the idea. The second idea is of course, you can also use topological techniques to, uh, sort of, you know, in convolution neural networks, you can use uh, topology based techniques uh, to quantify the behavior of, uh, of the neural network. And this is really the this is sort of one of the very earlier work, but the uh, Neurops workshop has a lot more examples how topology techniques is used to quantify the behavior of a deep of a model using deep learning. Okay. And of course, a topology technique can be also used for dimensionality reduction. For example, you know, uh, some very interesting topology-based uh, example for dimensionality reduction is to use topology to parameterize the points. So if you look at the picture C and D and E, there's actually some fundamental difference between C and D E. C is a projection of a high dimensional knot, okay? So what is a knot? It's sort of like a, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a loop that is embedded uh, in 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 three dimensional space in a very interesting way. So so if you look at it, you know even if what my projected space it looks very funky, right? It doesn't look like a loop to me at all. But because I'm using topology to learn that it's a knot, it's sort of a you know, a loop in the high dimensional space, I can parameterize, in this case, a parameterization is visualized by color. So I can use rainbow color to trace out that entire loop, okay? That is a picture C. On the picture D and E, the original data, instead of having one single loop, is actually two loops that is, you know, forming a ring like this. So again, the parameterization is going to parameterize each individual loop. Okay, so in some sense that, you know, compare C with D and E, it's kind of tell you that they are fundamentally different because, you know, one has one loop and the other two has two loops. Now, if you look at the top picture, compare A and B, the point cloud is a sampling of the surface of my donut, right? It's, again, it's a torus. So while I'm projecting the torus onto two-dimensional space, a very natural thing we're going to see is the middle of the, uh, the donut hole, basically, that tunnel. So you can parameterize this tunnel using a rainbow color. So you show that in my projection, you can still see that you know, loop in the projection. However, there's additional loop that you lose when you project it into two dimensional space because the torus itself is basically a cylinder glued at the very end. So there's an extra loop 
that is going around the surface of the torus. And when you project it, you lose that information. However, if I can parameterize or, you know, again, using rainbow color in the picture A of the slides, you can see there's a rainbow color that goes along from the inside to the outside of this torus. So again, I'm using parameterization to try to preserve the loop structure, even if I don't see that loop in the projection. Okay. So that is really the high level idea of how you use topology to do dimensionality reduction is you study the topological structure of the point cloud in the original high dimensional space. And then you kind of use that information to design your projection. Well, I can go beyond by not detecting just loops, but also some sort of branches and so on and so forth. And the other component, so I'm venturing into more applications in the more theoretical side. The other component, uh, you know, which I'm very personally very excited about is how topology techniques can be used to study what's called stratification learning. So what is a stratification? It's, um, it's sort of, my data is not just one piece of manifold, but it's a mixture of manifold of different dimensions. And then my favorite example is what's called a pinched torus. If I take a torus, it sort of has a nice smooth surface. And if I were like standing on the surface of a torus, locally, every single place I go looks like a small plane in my local neighborhood. So that is a manifold, right? But in this case, the pinched torus is no longer a manifold because I take one loop part of my torus and I extract it into a single point and it's kind of, I pinched it, right? So if I look, if I'm like an ant standing at that single point, my local neighborhood is no longer looks like a plane. It's something much more complicated. So what you get is what's called a stratified space, meaning that the space can be decomposed into pieces where each piece is a manifold. For example, in this case, my space is a pinched torus with a disc that close off the hole. And that can be decomposed into four different pieces. Okay, the surface is a two is a corresponding to two dimensional pieces. And then the, the surface where the disc attached to the pinched torus is another piece of surface. And then there is this sort of the pinched point that is another piece of the manifold. So again, the idea is if I have data that is sampled, not just from a single manifold, but a mixture of manifold, what do I learn from there? Again, you can use a lot of topological techniques in that space. So let's talk about challenges and opportunities. And I would like to leave at least a few minutes for questions and answers. So, you know, given all this, there's a lot of still a lot of things of how you use topology techniques in practice, for, for, for example, in data science. One is to study the robustness of topological structures. One is scalability, right? So how do I compute those topological structures? How do I compute persistent homology? when my data is huge. So there's still a lot of active research um, in how to deal with big data. How do I deal with not just big data, but data which is very high dimension, okay? And how does, you know, like a topological data analysis interface with statistics and machine learning, which I personally think is a very exciting direction that the field is moving towards and how it's integrate with visualization. Um, and then there's also usability, right? Uh, interpretability of those tools. So to give you a sense of some of the previous project, I'm just going to give you a bullet list of the project that has been done in this class. And all the ones with a, a sort of a star are the ones actually leads to a research paper, published research paper. So um, my sort of my hope is your research project or your class project is at the level of a good research project, right? I'm not interested in a survey. I'm interested in something that is innovative um, for, for the project. So, well, okay. So some of the class project, people have used topology techniques to study thermodynamics models. Um, they also have, you know, the second project was quite interesting where it's actually done by two uh, senior students where they took uh, thermal images, right? If you imagine what's a thermal image, you put on those goggles and then you can see folks, you know, this happening in a lot of action movies, right? You can see moving object based on their heat signature. So what they do is they take those thermal images of people 
And then they use the rib graph to get a body sort of skeleton. And then that skeleton from the thermal image, you can capture their different motion. For example, if I do something like this, right, the thermal image is going to give me two loops versus I'm doing something like this. So they were capturing on the fly um, folks moving in front of the thermal camera and then getting the skeleton of the, uh, of the people um, as they dance in front of the camera. So I thought that was very exciting. There's uh, some applications of using mapper techniques on Netflix data. Um, they were using um, a, you know, topology techniques to study periodicity in time series. Stratification learning, as I mentioned before, how do you kind of study point cloud sample from stratified spaces? Uh, so kind of learn the underlying partition into different uh, manifold pieces. Um, there is also um, uh, using some topology technique to study the grasp stability, which is in robotics. So how, do, how a robot's arm grab, hold an object. Um, there's also study over distribution of how to speed up mapper computation. Uh, how it's related to uncertainty in data and uncertainty visualization. Um, how is we can use topology to study uh, the temperature data from pregnant mice, uh, which is really cool because part of this is that uh, you know, like human, when uh, when 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 a mouse uh, gets pregnant, their temperature changes. So you can measure the temperature change over time, and then using topological techniques to try to detect uh, when. Uh, a mice is pregnant. But in addition to it, you can put the mice, um, you can jet lag the mice. So basically what you do is you kind of shine lights at them, you kind of disturb their natural biological cycle, and then you can look at how their signature changes using topological techniques. So it's a very fun uh, set of data. And there's also, of course, um, how do you use uh, topology techniques to study sensor networks. So what is a sensor network? Think about a bunch of cameras uh, or robots with cameras moving around in the domain, um, or you can have a bunch of camera that can sort of change the angles. Those can all be modeled as sensors. And then one of the question in sensor network study using topology techniques is to try to look at the coverage of the sensors. So you would like basically having, you know, if it's a mobile sensor, you want the, mo the mobile sensor to move around, that there's no area in the domain that is not detected by the sensor, right? So this is a sort of a security uh, motivation where I would like to make sure there's no intruders, right? Because if an intruder shows up, if at least one sensor sees an intruder, right? It's a very secure space versus if there's kind of an area where no sensors can see, then you can imagine a potential intruder can go into the domain. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, the more extreme version is that uh, there's a student project who looked at all the uh, suicide bomber in Afghanistan, um, the data from, you know, collected in there. And then there's also study of, um, you know, of course the brain data, as I mentioned before, there's a connection between open space, um, which is a software used to, uh, in astronomy visualization. Um, and then there's also sort of application of topology techniques to study the migration of birds and so on and so forth. So those are, very different examples of uh, previous course projects and so on. And um, my best suggestion for kind of looking at how you want to pick up a class project is first of all, figure out whether you want to have a partner or not. And with you and your partner kind of go over, uh, you know, most of the, in the Canvas page, most of the course material is already there. So you can kind of look ahead what you might be learning and so on. And as we go along for the next uh, one month and a half, roughly, uh, start you know kind of talking to your partner to figure out what you want to work on. And then of course, communicate with me before you do your proposal so that we know roughly what you have in mind. Um, and like I said before, I think there's a very exciting area which is combined topology techniques with machine learning. And I think there's a lot of open question there. And then the starting point will be looking at the nearest workshop um, and what people has been working on and so on. Okay. And of course, I planned twice as much of a content. Um, I want to give an example of uh, uh, a really recent project that I'm very excited about of how to use topology to study uh, sort of neural networks. And uh, I'm put the paper there. And if I have time later in the semester, I will go over uh, I will go over this uh, this particular project, which give you a flavor of the type of project you can do uh, using topology uh, to study machine learning. It doesn't have to be deep learning, but also, you know, like I said, you know, 80, 90% of paper right now in Europe are on deep learning. So um, 
um, it's a tropic, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting and hot area that uh, uh, people are trying to understand. Okay, so here are some references. I listed a lot of those references later. You're going to go over. So, um, and what I plan to do uh, for uh, the remaining of the class is as we go along, right? I have the initial reading list, but I'm going to add a little bit more, and I'm going to give you some taste of how, you know, a lot of the paper you're going to see um, or the technique we're going to learn are sort of the most newest techniques which happened over the past few, few years. Um, so, you know, in some sense, you are, I'm hoping to cover sort of the techniques from topology data analysis that is really at the forefront of the field. Okay. And, and like I said, in general, it's an extremely exciting area that it has a set of very interesting tools um, uh, that can be used uh, for data analysis. Okay. So um, I've been talking nonstop for close to 80 minutes. So um, questions uh, and so on. You can uh, unmute yourself, you can chat. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question from a very early slide where you showed the three Taurus. <laughs> this one? Um, yes, uh, okay. and you're explaining how the, the graph on the right, I thought that you said you look at the, you go from top to bottom and look at two rings and look at the, the yes. minimum. Uh, could, could, you, could you explain that one more time? So, okay, so let me see if I can annotate. This is the best one I can annotate. Um, next time I'm going to share it with my iPad. Did you see my drawing here? Yep. So what happened? I have a height function goes this direction, yeah? And I pick up a height value. Let's say this height value is height value of five. I'm looking at all the points. Remember, this is a torus that is standing up on the surface, right? It's, so it has a height value from the lowest point to the highest point. And I pick up a height value and I look at all the points that has, has this height value. And that corresponded to the two loops that is on the surface, which I just drew, right? Mm -hmm. Now yep. the leap graph is shrinking each of those loops because they are two disconnected pieces. Mm -hmm. For each of the piece, I kind of shrink it to a point. Okay, That's that, what that makes does. sense. Yeah. 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 So, so now you do this sort of, you know, actually in, uh, in, 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 in the mass notation, this is a quotient operation, but all that does is you take a component and each of the component, you shrink it to a point. And then as you change the height value, all this point connect into the rib graph on the right hand side, which captures this loop, this loop, and this loop. Okay. But I have to be careful here because this is now a skeleton of my data. And during this process, I do lose information, right? The information I lost is, for example, in, air, in the surface of my torus, there's other information, for example, like geometric information, like the curvature. All those information is lost during this process, right? So in some sense, think I almost think about this as what I would call topological compression, right? I take my data, I compress it into a much smaller representation that still preserve the topological information, which is those three loops, but it throw away some other information. And if you think about storage, right? The original data, I need to store it as sort of the mesh structure together with function value on every single point. And now my storage is, you know, a much smaller representation, which is this graph. I mean, there's still height values on top of the nodes in there, but it's a much, much smaller and compact representation. Okay. So that's why this particular technique was used for sort of getting signatures for say shape classification. Because if I have complicated shapes, I can reduce them to a smaller representation and I can use that smaller representation for classification. Another interesting component to this is as I mentioned before, if my domain does not break or tear during this process, depends how you choose this function. Here, the function is a height function, but I can choose other function, for example, like a curvature as a function. Then if my shape actually change posture, this skeleton doesn't really change that much. So for example, you know, I'm gonna use myself as example, right? If I have a triangulated surface and I go like this versus I go like this, I mean, as long as I don't do this, in this case, I'm creating some extra loops, right? So my shape changes. But if I just do this, right? 
my skeleton is not going to change much. Okay, so there's certain sort of nice thing about topology is that when my shape deform, as long as there's no major topological changes, those skeleton has a lot of similarity with one another. So the original work of one of the you know macrograph, um, people use this kind of topological skeleton to look at shapes that has different posture. Okay, so anyway, any other questions? Uh, Mitchell asked, are there certain programming languages we're expected or allowed to use for assignments? So depends on the assignment. If it's assigned for a mini project, um, um, uh, I would I would pro pretty much point you to uh, to sort of software tools that is either developed um, in Python or uh, I think most of them are Python based. So yeah, so it would be good to know some Python, but you know, if you if you're unsure um, and you have zero programming language background, let me know and talk to me after the class uh, during my office hour. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is that for the final project, um, I have no constraint over which programming language you're gonna use. You can use your favorite one. Um, so there's no constraint, but I do expect you to have some background in data structure and, uh, and, and uh, algorithms uh, to be able to understand a lot of material that's going to be covered. Uh, in this class. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop the streaming and you can feel free to ask me more questions. Um, and then um, let's see. So stop share.